Namaste. So in the last episode, we saw how Shankaracharya is dismantling <laughs> the objection by the opponent, point by point. And the first point he makes is that the Upanishads are not about rites, rituals, Vedic sacrifices, or actually any kind of actions at all. The Upanishads are about knowledge, specifically knowledge of Brahman. And to bring it to a head, he quotes from the Upanishads, first that blockbuster quote from Brihadaranyaka, that when to the knower of Brahman, everything has become the self, then what is there to know? And through what? In other words, there is no duality in Brahman, so there is no subject-object relationship. That means there's no knowledge, there's no knowing, there's no knower. And so there is no consciousness, no object of consciousness, and no seer. This means that there is no such thing as action. There's no agent, there's no object, and there's no result. So then he drops the real bomb. Nor is Brahman an object of perception even though it stands as an established positive entity. For the unity of the self and Brahman, as stated in That Thou Art, Chandogya Upanishad 687, cannot be known otherwise than from the scriptural texts. This is such an important quote. I would like to go back and read that entire chapter because it's so instructive, but it's too long. It's a real rabbit hole. And I wouldn't want to take you on that chase. So, that thou art tattvamasi, aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman, and tattvamasi, you are also that same Brahman. This negates the perceptibility of Brahman. Not only is Brahman a non-dual entity in which there is no action of any kind, even the action of knowledge or consciousness, but we are all that Brahman. We are that. That is what everything is. Everything is Brahman and yet not Brahman. In material consciousness, Everything appears dual. There is a subject-object difference. There is a doer and an object and an action. We want to get beyond this. How do we get beyond it? Well, there's this passage in the Chandogya. <laughs> a Brahmin sends his son to a Vedic school, and he comes back 12 years later, having learned all four Vedas you know, by memory. And he's very puffed up and proud, you know. So the father says to him, well, in your training, did they teach you that knowledge, knowing which everything becomes known, the ultimate knowledge? And the boy goes, well, no, they didn't. Please teach me that knowledge, father. So then he begins to teach the son about Brahma. And every kind of example you could find, he presents to the boy. And the boy keeps asking, well, that's good, but I still don't understand. <laughs> Tattvama, see, you are Brahman. See, the boy is looking for an object. 
But Brahman is not an object. Brahman is never an object. Brahman is never perceived because it's never an object, not even an object of consciousness. So what is Brahman? Brahman is yourself. The perceiver, the seer, the knower. Not a doer, simply a witness. So tattvamasi is probably, as far as I know anyway, the most succinct, direct statement of what is Brahman. Brahman is you. Brahman is the self. So this is what people have to understand. They have to shift gears. Huh? All other knowledge, including the four Vedas, are about something else. A sacrifice, a deity, or some kind of philosophical or ritual observance. But the Upanishads are not like that. The Upanishads are about Brahman, about revealing Brahman as the self. Myself, yourself, you know, the, the dogs and cats, their selves, the plants, even the air, the sunshine, everything has a self. And that self is Brahman. So Brahman is all-pervading, all-penetrating, all-knowing, all-powerful, etc. And yet, and yet, there is no duality in Brahman. Brahman is not a doer. Well, then you might say, well, how does the material creation arise if Brahman doesn't do it? And the answer is, just like when the spring rains begin, all the plants and grasses arise spontaneously. So in the same way, just by the presence of Brahman, the world arises. And Brahman is simply the witness of it. So let's go on. As for the objection that instruction about Brahman is useless, inasmuch as it is neither acceptable nor rejectable, that is nothing damaging. For the attainment of the highest human goal of freedom becomes an accomplished fact only when the total eradication of all sorrows comes about as a result of the realization of the self as Brahman beyond acceptance and rejection. There is no choice. You cannot determine whether to accept or reject Brahman because Brahman is already everything, including yourself. So there's no chance to accept it or to reject it. It simply is what it is. But that doesn't mean that you can perceive it. Even if you believe in it, you still can't perceive it. But you can simply recognize it as, this is myself. I am Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi. And then taking that point of view, looking at the world, looking at life, is completely different. If there's any suffering. It never happens to the self. It may happen to the body, to the mind, and so on. Possessions, relationships, etc. But it never touches the self, because the self is transcendent, beyond birth and death, beyond enjoyment and suffering, constant, unchanging, this is the nature of Brahman. And this is what the objector, the opponent, doesn't understand. Because like the boy in Chandogya Upanishad, he is hooked on the idea of an object. And trying to make Brahman into an object will always inevitably fail.
As for the presentation of the deities, etc., for the sake of meditation, contained in the Upanishadic texts themselves, that raises no difficulty. And the footnote, for the purification and concentration of mind, for emancipation by stages, and for the attainment of the respective results, the Upanishads speak in some contexts of such deities as prana, qualified Brahman, as well as of the subsidiary factors and the results of such meditations. But that does not mean that the Upanishads are concerned with these alone. As a matter of fact, their main concern is to reveal the unity of the self and Brahman. The absolute Brahman cannot even in that way become a factor in any injunction about meditation. For when unity is achieved, it is but reasonable that all ideas of duality, involving action, accessories, etc., should be eradicated, because the absolute Brahman is neither acceptable nor rejectable. So it's already so. It's not that Brahman has to be realized in the same way as we learn some kind of knowledge. Brahman is already the self. And as we've pointed out so many times, if you ask anyone, are you conscious? Of course, they're going to say yes. But if you ask them, how do you know you're conscious? It's going to be difficult for them to answer unless they've studied Upanishadic philosophy, which says that I am the self. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. So the correct answer to the question is, I am Brahman, so I am aware of my awareness. I am conscious of being conscious. More than just conscious of the objects, I'm conscious of my consciousness. See, that's going meta. That's going up to another level. Most people walk around simply conscious of the objects of consciousness. And they don't actually recognize their consciousness of consciousness itself. So they don't know that they are Brahman, even though they are. One simply has to point it out. And then one immediately gets it. Ah, oh yes, of course, I am the consciousness. So this is the secret. This is what the whole Upanishads are teaching in so many different ways. Gradually, step by step, they give all the different stages of liberation. And how does that work? One superimposes an image, a metaphor on Brahman. And then gradually that metaphor is made more and more subtle until it's removed entirely. And one directly sees, aham brahmasmi, tattvamasi, we are Brahman. Not that the perception of duality can crop up again from past impressions, even after being wholly uprooted by the realization of non-duality. If that were a possibility, then alone could it be shown that Brahman becomes involved in any injunction about meditation. Although Vedic texts are not seen elsewhere to have any validity without being construed with injunction, still, in the face of the fact that the knowledge of Brahman does culminate in its result, that is, emancipation, the validity of the scriptures dealing with the means of that emancipation cannot be set aside. Nor is the validity of the Upanishads to be established by inference, in which case alone it would have been necessary to cite analogous cases. Therefore, it is proved that Brahman is known from the scriptures alone. Brahman isn't even an object of meditation. Because Brahman is imperceivable, it cannot be grasped even by consciousness, except only 
Brahman's consciousness of itself, consciousness of consciousness, awareness of awareness. This is Brahman. This is Turiya. This is enlightenment. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.